Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in systematic theology by Professor John Frame. We're going to look at 433 to 443. We're going to look at uh, part two of uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. God is triune. And uh, part two is very good. I really like what he did in part two. Let's go to block one and look at the divine Trinitarian character as normative. As normative, God is not mere oneness. He has a complex Trinitarian character. And God exhibits that character in multifaceted greatness. So as situational, we're looking at God exhibiting a multifaceted greatness. God is rich in being and sometimes speaks in the plural, like in Genesis 1, let us make man in our image. As existential, God is three hypostasis personhoods. As the divine word, which is differentiated from God himself, in John 1, 1 through 14, the prologue to the Gospel of John. So for our outline, we have normative, God's multifaceted Trinitarian character. Situational, that Trinitarian character becomes the divine word as spoken and made manifest. We experience that existentially as our encounter with the personhoods through the fellowship of the divine word. So Frame gives us our outline as usual. This time he's concentrating on the triune character, and uh, which I am glad he's doing because I think it's very powerful to concentrate on the triune character of God. And he really gives us a wonderful detail in block two. Let's go to block two and look at the divine Trinitarian character as our situation. And remember, our situation for frame is a situation of living under the lordship of Christ. We all live under the lordship of Christ. So we encounter uh, the word as spoken. We experience God's lordship as control, authority, and presence. And through the three perspectives as normative, situational, and existential. And here's key. We discover a certain type of language that is raised to the divine. We discover, uh, we discover that, of course, in Scripture. But... Uh, we recognize this is something more than simply language. We discover language raised to the divine. And therefore, we, uh, we discover that uh, raised language in a doctrine of the Trinity. And that doctrine unifies love and knowledge and power. And we discover that the doxa glory of God applies to all three personhoods of the triune Godhead. The doxa glory applies to all three. And that frame takes us to 2 Corinthians 13, 14, where we hear of the grace of the Son, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit. Now this is Paul, of course. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity didn't evolve until around the 4th century, so Paul didn't have a belief in a formal doctrine of the Trinity, but what Frame is pointing out is that the triune Godhead was very much something Paul was aware of. Paul was very aware, even though there was no formal doctrine of the Trinity, they didn't show up until the 4th century, Paul was very aware of a triune Godhead. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, where Paul speaks of the grace of the Son and the agape, love of the Father, and the fellowship, the koinonia fellowship of the Spirit. So we experience our situation includes 
love, word, and spirit. Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made by the breath of his mouth, all their host. This is, again, language of a triune Godhead. Not a formal doctrine of the Trinity, but language of a triune Godhead. The Father is a speaker. The Son is the spoken word. The Spirit is he who equips the person that hears this message. Now, what I like about Block 2 that uh, I had never encountered this before, but what I like about Block 2 that John Frame did is he, the the key to me is uh, note, Block 2, Note 1, C. We encounter in Scripture a new kind of language, a language raised to the divine, a language raised to deity, is the way he puts it. It's a new kind of language you discover, and so it's uh, it's not just this is not an everyday book. This is this is not just another book. This is a language that can change a life. This is a language that can uh, create new existence. This is a powerful language, a language raised to the divine. And then he goes on to say that. Uh, Even though there is not a formal doctrine of the Trinity until the 4th century, the necessary aspects for that doctrine are present in the language of Scripture. The elements are there. Because in 2 Corinthians, Paul did speak of the grace of the Son, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit. Paul was very aware of a triune Godhead, even though... It wasn't until the 4th century that the um, church itself formulated a doctrine of the Trinity. But Paul was very aware of the triune Godhead. So I think it's a very powerful that uh, Block 2, our situation is an encounter with a new kind of language. I love that. Our situation in life is uh, one of encountering a new kind of language that uh, transcends normal language. It transcends everything we know about language. It's a completely new kind, a transcendent kind of language. And especially when the Spirit is equipping the Word of Scripture and and then it becomes a life transformative, and renews the mind. It's, it's, it's a new kind of language. I love what he did in block two there. Block three, the divine Trinitarian character as existential. It's, it's, we encounter the divine personhoods in our existence. John 16, 28, Jesus comes from the Father. John 15, 26, and Jesus sends the Spirit from the Father. There you have all three. The blessings of salvation are experienced as three personhoods, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Acts 10.38, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then it says, and he went about doing good. Right there in the, in the book of Acts, there's uh, all three aspects, all three personhoods. Well, we get to Acts 2.33, and it says that Christ has been exalted to the right hand of the Father, where he has received the promise of spirit. So a couple of places in the book of Acts point to these triune Godhead. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power, and then again in Acts 2, that was Acts 10, then Acts 2, Christ has been exalted to the right hand of the Father and has received the promise of Spirit. We now experience the pouring out of the Spirit, Acts 2, 38 and 39. We see all of this. Uh, We read in Galatians, uh, 
we see all of this as exemplified in the very uh, conversion of Paul, says Frame. He said, if you look at the conversion of Paul, which was an apocalyptic conversion, remember, it, uh, I call it the apocalypse of Damascus. But he says, if you look at the conversion of Paul, we see, we see the pouring out of the Spirit. We see the presence of the Father and the Son. And uh, that conversion experience is described in Acts 9, 17 through 20. So Frame says, you know, you can look at the experience of Paul and Paul's encounter on the road to Damascus was an encounter with God. It was his conversion involved a miraculous encounter with God. But he heard what? He heard the voice of the Son. And he was flooded with the light of the Holy Spirit. The uh, apocalypse of Paul's conversion was a triune event. And it's the, it's the same thing that's true for all of us. We've talked about it in past lessons, but conversion, redemption, salvation is a triune event. A person is drawn by the Father to the Son. Then we hear the word of the Son. And then we are sealed with the Spirit. Well, what do you think happened to Paul on the road to Damascus? He encountered God the Father. And in that encounter, he heard the word of Christ. And he also was flooded by the light of the Holy Spirit. Paul's apocalyptic conversion was a triune event. So John Frame is correct in saying, go to Acts 9, 17 through 20, and it is, a, it is evidence of a triune event. It is, even though it wasn't until the 4th century that uh, the doctrine of the Trinity formally evolved, even in the uh, early church, Paul was very aware of the triune Godhead. And uh, we have many instances of that in the book of Acts that Luke wrote. So Luke, Paul's friend, was very aware of the triune Godhead. We looked at uh, Acts 10, we looked at Acts 2, we looked at Acts 9, all of this in part 3 here. Acts 10:38, Acts 2:33, and Acts 9, 17 through 20. So Luke was very aware, you know, Luke is a very good friend of Paul. Luke was very aware of the triune Godhead, even though there was no formal doctrine of the Trinity. It's very much a part of the scriptures, and uh, that's why the church, the uh, at least the Protestant church, well, really, Protestant and Catholic both uh, have affirmed, strongly affirmed, a doctrine of the Trinity. And, you know, uh, the, our church, which is Southern Baptist, we affirm, we believe, we affirm a doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and even though it didn't evolve until, form, un, until the 4th century, to become formal doctrine, Frame points out it was very much present in the minds of Luke and in the mind of Paul. And very early on, very early on, there was a tremendous awareness of the triune Godhead. Now, just to wrap up, because we're pretty much got this part two completed, just, just go back to block one, three, and look at our outline to close again. Normative, we're looking at the fact that God has a multifaceted Trinitarian inner character. Situational, that Trinitarian character makes itself known as divine word as spoken and the, div the divine word as spoken becomes made manifest. Existentially, we, we end up encountering the triune personhoods of the Godhead through the fellowship of the Spirit, through the fellowship with Christ. 
or Schramm puts it, through the fellowship with the divine word. Well, who is the divine word? The person of Christ. Christ, the person, is the divine word. Um, if you want to be precise, John chapter 6 says that Christ is the rhema, the spoken lagos. Christ is the spoken lagos. He is the rhema, John chapter 6. The Father is the eternal lagos. The Son is the rhema, the spoken lagos. God the Father goes out of himself as eternal lagos to become incarnate through the rhema, spoken lagos, of the Son, and then through the redemptive work of the Son and the Holy Spirit, all of creation is lifted up into the return moment back to the Father. That's going to wrap up uh, 433 to 443. That was part two of the Doctrine of the Trinity. And believe it or not, he has a part three. <laughs> I didn't know that, but he does. So next time, we're going to go uh, 446 to 455. 446 to 455 next time on the deity of the personhoods. Part three of the Doctrine of the Trinity next time. And again, very powerful, I think, on this part two. I'm very impressed with this part two. That wraps up 433 to 443.